medcram.com. Hey guys, welcome to another MedCram video. Today we're going to talk about tape. Tape for apnea or sleep apnea. And we're going to look at the data and see where its place is. For those who don't know, I am a sleep specialist and I have no financial incentives for tape or against tape. But I do treat obstructive sleep apnea and I know that the way that we decide whether or not we do something is to look at reproducible data. So we're gonna look at the available data and see what we think about tape for sleep apnea. But first, what is sleep apnea? Here we have a cross-section of someone who is sleeping. And we know that when we're breathing, oxygen needs to go in, carbon dioxide needs to come out. But as we get older, particularly in men, our tongues start to fall backwards and can obstruct this area here, and that can cause a problem with no breathing at night. This is known as obstructive sleep apnea. Even though the lungs are trying to take a breath in, the air does not get in, and as a result of that, oxygen levels drop, and the brain senses that and becomes very panicked when oxygen levels drop. Our sympathetic nervous system becomes activated to arouse us out of that sleep so that that airway can open up. And of course, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, and over repeated stimulations throughout the night of this, eventually what happens is that our sympathetic nervous system becomes hyper ramped up, as you see here in somebody with obstructive sleep apnea, during the day when they're awake. And this can cause a lot of problems overnight. To the point where you can see here in white, the most common time for people with obstructive sleep apnea to die is actually in the quartile between midnight and 6 a.m. when we're actually supposed to be sleeping. And it's because of these huge swings in oxygen and sympathetic nervous system activity. Whereas in people without sleep apnea, as you can see here in no OSA groups, you see the most common time for them to die is between 6 a.m. and noon, which is when cortisol levels are actually the highest. So you can see here that the body is undergoing a tremendous amount of stress. The tried and true treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is CPAP, basically air pressure down here to inflate this area off the back and allow breathing to go back and forth. But there are other mechanisms for this as well. One of them is a mandibular advancement device or a dental device that moves the jaw forward, bringing the tongue off the back and opening that up. There's also the Inspire device or a hypoglossal nerve stimulator, which contracts this portion of the muscle of the tongue and also shortens it and gets the tongue off the back. The bottom line here is that it's a physical problem and needs a physical solution. You need to have an open airway. There are surgical treatments for this as well, where they actually can break the jaw and move the jaw forward. Tracheostomy, which you just bypass this whole thing here and allow the patients to breathe past that, that's done in extreme circumstances and not really your first choice. So let's look at a few studies that looked at mouth taping. This was published in 2022 in September, and it's titled The Impact of Mouth Taping in Mouth Breathers with Mild Obstructive Sleep Apnea, a Preliminary Study. The issue is when you are breathing through your mouth, it allows the tongue to fall back and you get this obstruction in the back. However, if your mouth remains closed, it tends to pull the tongue back off and air is able to go through the nose down into the trachea, and you're able to relieve that obstruction. So I want to look at a few studies that have been done and go through them in real time as we look, and we're going to go through in chronological order. So we'll start back at a different study back in 2014. This was a paper titled Novel Porous Oral Patches for Patients with Mild Obstructive Sleep Apnea and Mouth Breathing, a pilot study. As I mentioned, it was published in 2014. Unfortunately, I don't have access to this. We're just going to have to look at the abstract. But you can see here that it was a prospective study, which is important to see that. And it's also important which patients were included in the study. So before we go on, just know that habitual open mouth breathing is the condition, OMB. That's what they abbreviated in this study. And that POP is the porous oral patch that they put over the mouth to keep the mouth closed. That's the tape, if you will. The subjects and methods is important. So patients with greater than five events hourly, but less than 15 hourly. That's important to understand because that's essentially mild obstructive sleep apnea. And the reason why they would have known that is because they actually did a polysomnography on these patients. In other words, they did a sleep test. 
Patients who are tested and formally diagnosed with sleep apnea are the only ones that would know if their sleep apnea is mild because it is graded by something called the AHI, which is the Apnea Hypopnea Index. And apnea is the amount of times that you completely stop breathing. That means no flow for at least 10 seconds. A hypopnea is where there is a 30% reduction in airflow, which causes a desaturation nevertheless. That's a hypopnea. If you add those up throughout the entire night and you divide it by the number of hours that you slept, that would be the AHI. And mild is considered 5 or more to 14. Clearly, we're looking at mild. Not moderate, not severe. We're looking at mild in this study. Notice they say here that all patients slept with their mouths closed by using a POP, that's that porous adhesive that goes onto the mouth, which is a porous skin pad consisting of three layers, silicone sheet, polyurethane foam, and a polyurethane film before treatment and also during treatment. Subjective outcomes were used with an Epworth sleepiness scale score. This is a way of measuring how sleepy somebody is and a visual analog scale where they can show how much they were snoring. Outcomes were assessed using polysomnography and also cephalometry. 30 patients were enrolled in this study. All patients slept. So that's an important thing to understand here is that there was no control group. These were all patients that served as their own control. The problem is when you do that, you don't filter out the placebo effect. So just be aware of that. The Epworth sleepiness scale score was 8.1, plus or minus 1.5, and the VAS was 7.5 before they used the POP. And the Epworth sleepiness scale score went down to 5.2, and the VAS went down to 2.4 during the time that they used the POP. And that was statistically significant. Notice that the AHI score was significantly decreased from 12 per hour before treatment to 7.8 per hour during treatment. That was also statistically significant. Notice also with cephalometry that the retropalatal space and retrolingual space, as was predicted, went from 7.4 to 8.6 and therefore increased in size slightly, and that was statistically significant. So their conclusion was this adhesive device was a useful device to treat patients with mild OSA and habitual OMB. Couple of thoughts. This was for mild obstructive sleep apnea. If someone had moderate or severe, this data really has nothing to say about that. So just be aware of that. And I say that specifically for people who believe they may have obstructive sleep apnea or may snore and they've never had a sleep study. If you've never had a sleep study, you don't know if you have mild, moderate, or severe obstructive sleep apnea. The other thing I would caution here is that there was no control group. So it's unclear whether or not the difference that we saw with them wearing the POP was because they were wearing the POP or whether or not there was a placebo effect. Not only the subject, but also the researcher can tell when the patient is wearing the device. Let's go to 2022 and our next article. This article titled Mouth Closing to Improve the Efficacy of Mandibular Advancement Devices in Sleep Apnea was published in 2022 and was the product of Harvard Medical School and Sleep Apnea Dentists of New England, Boston, Massachusetts. It also came out of the Division of Sleep and Circadian Disorders at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So again, the rationale is that mouth breathing increases upper airway collapsibility, as we've talked about before, leading to decreased efficacy of obstructive sleep apnea treatments. So here they're looking at this as an adjunct to an actual treatment, in this case, a mandibular advancement device. They hypothesize that the use of mandibular advancement devices increases mouth breathing and thus using an adhesive mouthpiece known in this study as an AMT to prevent mouth breathing in combination with an MAD can improve treatment efficacy. They evaluated using a MAD and a adhesive in comparison to just using the mandibular advancement device alone. But as we'll see here, they did actually get into looking at AMT alone. So here they used a prospective, that's good, crossover pilot study. That's a really good design to test this hypothesis. They said that briefly, adult participants with an apnea hypopnea index between 10 and 50 events per hour, this is much bigger, this is mild, moderate, even severe, at the screening visit were randomized to no treatment, which is the baseline, MAD treatment, that's just the mandibular advancement device alone, 
AMT treatment, that's just the adhesive alone, and MAD and AMT treatment together. There's a control group, there's a MAD only, there's an AMT only, and then there's a combination. As primary analysis, absolute AHA was compared between MAD and the MAD and AMT arms, and then there was secondary analysis included. So much better design than the previous study, including not just mild sleep apnea like we saw in the first study, but mild, moderate, and even severe. So let's see what they found. They said a total of 21 participants were included, and the baseline AHI was quite impressive, 24.3. That's more real world than looking at people with AHIs in the tens because this is usually where your significant sleep apnea people lie. The median AHI interquartile range in the MAD and the MAD plus AMT arms were, the first one's gonna be just the mandibular advancement device, and then the second one's gonna be the combination of the mandibular advancement device and the adhesive. So it went from 10.5 down to 5.6. That was statistically significant. A total of 76% of individuals achieved an AHI of less than 10 events per hour in the combination arm versus only 43% in just the MAD arm. That was also statistically significant. Finally, the observed effect was similar in moderate to severe OSA with AHI of greater than 15 events per hour. They say in terms of absolute reduction and treatment responders, the AMT alone, basically putting tape on your mouth with nothing else, no dental device, nothing else, they say did not significantly reduce the AHI compared with baseline. And so their conclusions was a combination of an adhesive mouthpiece and MAD together is more effective than just MAD alone. And these findings may help improve clinical decision-making in sleep apnea. But notice here, when we're talking about just using tape, there was not a statistically significant or even clinically significant improvement over the baseline. They say in their discussion, indeed, our data support this hypothesis as we showed the addition of an AMT, that's the adhesive, to the mandibular advancement device resulted in a significant reduction in the AHI, as well as an increase in the number of subjects who achieved a post-treatment AHI of less than 5 or 10 events per hour. These findings are relevant and provide evidence for a novel direction and therapeutic approach to these patients. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first study to examine the efficacy of combined MAD and AMT therapy. They do talk about that study that we showed you earlier on. They say a previous study evaluated the efficacy of a similar AMT device in isolation and only in those with mild OSA. Remember, the authors previously only admitted people into the study with an HI of 5 to 15, whereas here they went anywhere from 10 to 50. They, meaning the previous study, used a porous oral patch consisting of three layers, and we went through that, in 30 participants with mild OSA. The HI ranged from 5 to 15, and they reported a 35% reduction in HI from baseline. In our study, AMT alone did not result in a significant reduction in AHI. Why would this study be a better study than the previous one? This one actually has a control group, and it was a crossover. That's a very powerful study design. They say a potential explanation is the inclusion of a more severe sample in our study. I agree with that. Here we're dealing with not just mild obstructive sleep apnea, we're dealing with moderate and severe, where simply using tape may not be appropriate. And furthermore, if people think they have sleep apnea and go right to the tape, they will not know if in fact they have mild, moderate, or severe sleep apnea. Here we can take a look at some of these graphs. This is the AHI in the MAD plus the MAD and the adhesive, and you can see that there is definitely a trend towards improvement in that AHI. Of course, there are some that got worse, but overall the trend in is that the adhesive is helpful so long as there is a primary device that is actually doing the heavy lifting. Once again, when we look at the number of responders, complete response, incomplete response, no response. Here we have MAD, that's the mandibular advancement device or the dental device, and this is it with the addition of the adhesive, and you can clearly see that there has been an improvement with the addition of the adhesive, but not with the adhesive alone. And here's another graph from this study. Here's the baseline, and we can see that when they added the AMT alone, this is what we had in terms of the AHI. 
this was not statistically significant. In other words, the tape alone by itself in this wide range of people with different ranges of sleep apnea, including mild, moderate, and severe, did nothing in terms of improving the number of times that these patients stop breathing at night. When we have just the MAD device by itself, you can see that there was a statistically significant reduction. And when you added the AMT compared to baseline, again, even more statistically significant reduction in the AHI. Let's go to our final study. This is one that was published in September of 2022, titled The Impact of Mouth Taping and Mouth Breathers with Mild Obstructive Sleep Apnea, a Preliminary Study looks as though they're going right back to just mild obstructive sleep apnea. But again, you would have to have a sleep study to know if you had mild obstructive sleep apnea. Let's jump quickly down to the study design. The inclusion criteria included patients between the ages of 20 and 60 with a body mass index of less than 30, AHI of less than 15, that would be mild, and witness mouth breathing during sleep, dryness on throat upon awakening, the exclusion criteria were significant retronathia, an allergy to mouth tape, intolerance to the sealing of the mouth. The mouth tape was dislodged from the origin of the site in the morning. Comorbidity of severe medical diseases, hypertrophy of the palatine tonsil, previous nose, palate, or tongue surgery, and shift workers. By the way, this was a retrospective design. Retrospective designs are just not as good as they introduce bias and confounders compared to studies that are prospective, randomized, and crossover. The one thing that I'm a little confused about and maybe disappointed here is that we don't know how many people they had to exclude because the tape had become dislodged in the morning. So that would be nice to have known. We do know that there was about 20 patients that met the inclusion criteria. We don't know how many they had to go through, however, to get to those 20. The age was about 38, mostly male. Height was 175 centimeters. Weight was 74 kilograms. And the BMI range was 23.6 to 26. The median was not overweight. That's important to understand. If you have somebody that's interested in using this tape, the question I would have first is, are they mild and are they overweight or underweight? Because I think that's going to be deciding whether or not this is translatable. So let's look at the events per hour. Here we have AHI before, here we have the AHI afterwards. Definitely a statistically significant reduction. And of course, the AHI is the important thing that we're looking at here, and that was statistically significant. The median went from 8.3 down to 4.7 in terms of the AHI. But even they talk about some limitations. They, firstly, the study has a small sample size without a control group. And that was exactly the issue that we saw in the first one. This is a retrospective study. So there is no comparison that could be made to determine whether or not there was a placebo effect. Now, as we said before, in that second study, there was a control group. In fact, it was a prospective crossover control group. And when you took all comers, mild, moderate, and severe, there was no statistical significant difference with tape. Second, this is a retrospective study with short follow-up period. No long-term effect was evaluated. Besides, the home sleep test used in the study may underestimate the severity of OSA. Also, the low proportion of women is another drawback. Finally, the follow-up period is short, and there could possibly be an issue with low adherence to mouth taping in the long term. That was the issue that we brought up, is we don't know how many of those that they had to go through to find the 20 that kept the tape on. Looking at the studies that we see, I think that tape would be a great thing to use in somebody who had a dental device and or somebody who knew that they had mild obstructive sleep apnea. Based on this data, and I'm open to look at other data if someone is able to present this, I do not think that somebody who is diagnosed with sleep apnea that is not mild or doesn't know if they have sleep apnea but wants to try it anyway because they snore, I don't think it would be appropriate to blindly put on this type of tape hoping that this is going to fix the problem. If anyone really does want to use tape, I would highly recommend getting tested with the tape in place to make sure that the sleep apnea does not exist. If you want to know more about obstructive sleep apnea, we actually have continuing medical education courses, not only for healthcare professionals, but also for the lay public who want to know more about their conditions, their diseases, take ownership of it, and be able to ask the right questions of their healthcare providers. So if you go to medcram.com, you'll see there a great course, Sleep Apnea Explained Clearly. 
If you like this video and the information in it, please subscribe, turn on notifications, leave us a comment, and join us at medcram.com.